Hey everybody, welcome back to the Hair Dye Podcast. We're your hosts, Jake Saldati and Chad Rothford. And we have two of our greatest guests of all time, our favorites, and they're together. I, the I don't think, time. yeah, this never happened, we have right? Together. We have Keep Marcus time, Walden and Josh Labendera. This is going to be... Uh, I'm just going to, I'm not even going to have to talk. Yeah, to we one. don't have to do nothing. We just let the guys that know baseball go. Uh, what's up, boys? What's going on? Uh, make sure you're downloading, subscribing, all that good stuff. We are, this is the new spot, kind of, it's not finished, but it. Uh, we are hosted and thankful for golf carts by design. We're here on 12 and 99 in Madeira. Uh, he's got a spot in Fresno on Blackstone as well. Articat, Cushman, Easy Go, you name it. I mean, you guys kind of seen the stuff walking in here. Walked around a little bit. It's real nice. nice. A lot of fun toys. Yeah, lots of lots of fun toys. Again, thank you to Golf Cart by Design. Make sure you guys, if you need a golf cart, whatever. Make sure you get your wife's approval. Yeah, he's getting some snowmobiles too. He told (laughs) me. So he's uh, got everything you need here. Again, we're on twelve and ninety nine in Madeira. Uh, Does have a spot in Fresno. Uh, Guys, it's been a minute. We've been out a couple weeks here, not doing much. Season's over. Haven't seen a lot of moving in free agency. Seen a couple trades. I saw the Cardinals, that pitching rotation's a little older, oh, yeah. let's say that, but maybe that's uh, more uh, experience, if you will, whatever you want to say, some coaching changes, nothing major, no signings, everybody's still speculating on Otani and all that, but just before we go into some baseball, how Labby, how you been, bro? How's life treating you? Hanging out, man, just uh, kind of getting the fall like closed in and, and boxed out and get my pref list sent in and... Um, you know, just it, it, do some home visits and, and meet some kids, meet some families and, and just kind of tighten up some, some work from the fall and, uh, get geared up to go in the spring again, uh, meetings in January. And, and once my feet hit the ground, I'll, I'll start rolling again and, uh, it'll be every day. So right now it's a little slower pace, uh, gives me a chance to work on a little of the short game, putt a little bit, but, uh, <laughs> that all comes to a screeching halt come January. So, uh, you know, it's, it's good to have some downtime kind of you know, not necessarily disconnect from the game, but, but get away from it for, for a little bit and then dive right back in. Well, and then I guess same to you, how you've been, and then remind me, I want to follow up with that, but how, what's yeah. going on, Marcus? How's uh, life treating you? You're back so home, I'm back home, enjoying the family. I got my four kids. I actually just got back from gymnastics with my girls and same. I mean, I see Labby at the course whenever I'm there, which is five, six days a week for me. Um, I've just been playing a lot, man. <laughs> Easy. I've been playing. Easy. I, uh, I've been trying to get it out there and, and just trying to get my handicap down a little bit, trying to play. Uh, but, no, I've just been spending some time with the kids while uh, we're not doing school and enjoying it. It's, you got some news? Yeah. I, I, I like. I know some people probably know. Yeah, there's some people that do. Um, I don't know if you set it on one degree. Mm-hmm. Okay. No, I mean, uh, so right now, I mean, I've, I've sent in my resume. I'm trying to go get a coaching job. But uh, baseball wise, baseball wise, as of right now, I'm not going to play next year. I'm so gonna, not I'm officially gonna, retired until I get a job. I but I, mean, I could go and physically go do it. If it if I can't get a coaching job here and I can crank it up in four or six weeks and and go throw. I've got some offers to go down to Mexico. Got some offers to go to Taiwan. Um, I really just want to go in the states and and go coach. And I think that's the uh, I want to get on to the the next chapter of my life. And I think coaching's where I want to go. Interesting. I'm happy for you. I appreciate Again, it. not a lot of guys, and you know this, get to leave on their own terms. No, not mm-hmm. at all. And, and considering kind of the at. career you've had, to be able to do that, dude, Pretty congrats. Awesome. You awesome. know, Thank you. And let's get started on the book. Like, There's a lot to say there. There's right? a long, a long, a lot of years there. 17 years playing professionally, and uh, I'm hoping to stay in the game. I know some guys that, that I've had coach me have been in the game for 40, 50, 60 years professionally, and I think that would be a, a cool journey to be in. And be able to go coach for another 30 or 40 years would be fun. Yeah, or, or you never thought about in some of that venture, a little scouting oh, yeah. maybe? Me and Labby have talked about it a little bit. Yeah. Obviously, Brian Oliver's a, a scout with the Tampa Bay Rays down in Arizona. Um, I got some good friends that do it. They they enjoy that lifestyle. I mean, he even said you'd be home more <laughs> yeah. scouting than you would be coaching. But uh, I think I want to go coach first. And and I like doing the player development. I like I've done some some coaching with some older guys and some guys getting into pro ball and guys that are in pro ball, and I like that avenue. I think it'll it's just something that kind of it ticks with me. It's baseball. It's, it's you baseball. can't. I mean, you guys can't stay no. away from it. No, not at all. No. But considering this is like kind of your slow time, no doubt, uh, it, dude. Like, congrats. I mean, it, it's I, I always 
I like talking about Marcus with the with the scout team. It, it's an awesome story. Um, and then to have him come out and then he gets to share it himself. Uh, I think it goes a long way with the kids. Um, but just to just to sit back and watch like, a you know, you say journeyman or a baseball lifer per se. Uh, that's, you know, man, you don't get to play this game for very long. At some point, somebody taps you on the shoulder when you get to lace your spikes up and hang them out for the last time yourself. Uh, it says something about what you did and, and the longevity that you had in the game. Uh, and, and what's remarkable about this guy is, you know, you listen to me, just said, hey, man, in four to six weeks, he could get it cranked back up. So it, it's just a testament of his work ethic. And uh, I mean, I wish a lot more younger kids were like him, that we'd have a lot more players that would play a lot longer. Could you be more specific maybe? And like, because for you, like when I talk to you, I don't hear like all the, it's not always necessarily like the bullpens. It's, it's a lot of the little detail stuff. Well, no doubt. I mean, it's just paying attention. I mean, you don't necessarily, you know, the kids that are that that stand out that end up moving on are the kids that they, they pay attention to like the little details, not just like the the, you know, the normal stuff, but like the little back picks. You know, the guys that do stuff instinctually, uh, they're just students of the game, man. And uh, when they're listening to guys talk, you know, they're you're a sponge, man. You're you're gonna absorb a lot of information. And you're gonna squeeze out a lot, but the stuff that you absorb, man, you can hold on to for a long time. And it might not be the next day that you can apply it. It's it's years down the road. You look back, you're like, dude, I remember that. I remember that guy talking about that. I remember Marcus Walden at, at Scout Ball talking about being on the bus or or what it was like having to go to independent ball to come back. And just, you know, it it goes a long ways having guys with, with resumes like this and, and careers uh, to be able to come out and share with the kids and stuff. And like I said, being a baseball lifer, man, there's something to be said about that. Uh, not a lot of guys get to hang around the game, especially – call it like a legitimate lifetime career so uh wish him the best of luck i think he'll be a great coach uh you know he's had a great career as a pitcher but um he he has a unique version of blending this new uh analytical stuff and and he does a really good job man i talked to a lot of high school coaches and dude this guy goes out and just volunteers his time yeah that's the high school programs you know and uh dude there's guys charging a lot of money around town that don't have anywhere near the background. This guy and this guy goes out and <laughs> donates his time to to teach kids and blend it, not just teach them to throw hard, but teach them how to use you know the data to to make them better pitchers, not just better throwers. Uh, so, uh, congrats to Mark. Uh, you know we're gonna lose a good ball player, but I think we're gonna gain a really really good young coach on the back end. So. Uh, good luck to him, and I hope he lands with the organization. Yeah, get a for guy sure. like this guy in pro ball. Yeah, so appreciate it. I mean, just to piggyback on what you were talking about, I think, I mean, just getting into a little bit of the private sector of doing lessons or or getting into like wanting to go help teams. A lot of guys are getting into, and I know it's what a lot of people are doing right now, but it's they want to do the individual lesson. They don't want to learn from like if I'm if all three all four of us are working in a group, Jake. There's something you could learn from me talking to Labby. Or mm-hmm. Labby talking to Chad, whatever, no matter what it is. And I think that's where I think a lot of the younger guys don't understand that there's so much learning to do outside of your little 45 minute pocket that you're with your private instructor of. If it is a hitting coach, a fielding coach, uh, whatever it is, your speed coach, it doesn't matter. But it's more about how do you how do you apply what they're going to tell somebody else into your own game? And I think that's where you get it. You go watch a big league game and go watch. For instance, the, the the Yankees go warm up their pregame bullpen. All of their starters are watching their guys. Toronto Blue Jays, the same way. The Red Sox were really good about it. We watched every single bullpen. Our bullpen guys watch their bullpen guys. Our starters watch our starters. And we're just learning and talking amongst ourselves when we're in the dugout. Hey, how, how do you hold that pitch? What do you do? I talked to Nate Evaldi a lot. I mean, I me and Nate talked a lot about cutters. Me and Nate talked. Rick Porcello showed me so many things when we weren't playing baseball, just sitting there chopping it up, talking, watching the game. And how does that apply two, three, four, five, six years later? And that's what I think a lot of kids right now, they're, they're in their own little, in their own little uh, fishbowl in their 45 minute lesson. And then once they get out of that, they're in their little practice with their high school group. And right now there's nobody practicing. So it's, they're in their 45 minute bowl and then they're done for the week or they do it twice a week or whatever that is, as opposed to learning from a different person, a different side of the game, a different way to look at something. Labby's going to teach two different guys two different things because they're two different ball players. Mm-hmm. But eventually, you're going to grow to being 6'3", 220 pounds. What about le- learning something from an eighth grader to a sophomore in high school and, and learning the longevity of this game and, and taking it, you know, listening to it now and taking it to 2027 and going like, 
I remember that. I remember that. And so that, that's kind of something I've seen as now that I'm getting into a little bit more of the, the private sector of doing some lessons and trying to go and help guys and doing group group stuff, going to high schools. Um, because when I was playing, I just, I worried about me and it was just me playing and, and how do I focus on, how do I get better? I mean, I was flying to Virginia to go to my buddy's place. I'd go anywhere to go get some help. Um, but talking, to, we've, we've done a lot of talking of, of where, how to get guys better. And I like the group setting of learning as a group of some peers and amongst your peers, how do you go get better? I know when I was in high school, it was me, Brian, and my brother, Robert would go and hit all together. Right. When we guys were at Fresno city, there's eight, 10, 12 of you guys going and hitting early an hour and a half before practice, just talking, Hey, what, what, so in it, so many situations that you're putting yourself into mentally that you don't get if you're not with those peers. So I think that's just something I would like to see more of as, as a, not only just youngsters across the board in any sport, getting with peers and, and, and talking about the game and going forward. Yeah, Roth. You so like Chad, you Labby. You guys do offensive stuff lessons. You've done a lot of pitching, Roth. I've noticed in the past when you were doing it, like you kind of liked groups. Yeah, small, I, like, I like small groups, right? <clears throat> yeah, like two or three. Yeah, Hitting's, four, four yeah. at the most. Hitting but. small, I'll do. I like big and I'm not a big. I'm saying, it was to say you two. You, I do my I like infield groups. I like to do. I mean, man, eight to twelve is kind of like a great number because now we can flip it around the infill. We can do double plays. Like, there's just and just to kind of go with Marcus says. Marcus says, but you know, going back to when I first started and playing pro ball, like I was very fortunate and lucky. Like, I got to work out with Jason Wood and, and Sean Gilbert. Like, you can't that that dude right there right alone was thirty five years of professional baseball hitting in the cage with me, and I'm like one year in. So, you know, to talk about being in a cage and, and being around guys that, that have experience and, and wisdom and knowledge, like, I think that's where the problem is today is these kids have this data and they think they, they've got it figured out because they're reaching these numbers, or these spin rates or these uh, exit velos or bat speed. Dude, you're so far away. Those are just a very small portion of, of, of the bigger picture. Uh, and and you got to take that wisdom and, and knowledge that these older guys are sharing and, and passing along Dude, and like I said, man, put, put it in, in the your game. Pu- yeah, and, and and put it in your game and, and apply it and and be versatile and that that aspect of, of being a having the aptitude and, and ability to make adjustments. Um, but I, you know, it's kind of like this this technology stuff is like really taken over where you know the numbers speak very loud and it's hard to really man, it's really hard to talk to a kid about having a feel when they see a number. It's like that number is like boom instantly. Hey man, I uh, dude, what are you talking it's a quick about? Quick gratification. That was ninety five with twenty eight hundred spin rate, dude. What are you talking about? Yeah. That, that I don't know how that ball, ball got hit. Well, got hit because it was right in the middle yeah. of the plate, or <laughs> you know, so forth. Yeah. So you know, having an opportunity to get around older guys that that have wisdom, experience, knowledge, um, to share it and to be able to grab it, dude. You got to be chomping at the bit like for an opportunity like that. So um, I just, man, it's hard. Um, these days to get these guys to kind of understand and buy into that philosophy. Uh, nothing against, hey, man, they say these guys that, you know, the technology is supposedly better, and I know there's a lot of it, but, you know, there's the meat and potatoes of baseball is not going to change, and the, the fundamentals per se haven't changed. So, uh, you know, you want to get around guys that can teach you yeah, and, if you, and guide you that if way. If you can find a guy that's knowledgeable in the tech and in the game side of it, Correct. that's a home run. And that's where I think the game on the professional side is going, and that's kind of the reason why – I want to get into coaching professionally now because I think it's changing from it used to be a lot of just old school baseball dudes that were that had played the game forever. And then they kind of got into a lot of nerds that understood the, the numbers like unbelievably well. And they 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 put a number that everything had a number to it. And now they're trying to get baseball players that understand the numbers. And I think that I not that it's me, but it's my genre or like my uh, my group of players that have. I mean, I played from 2007 to 2016 with no numbers. There was no rap soda. There was nothing. You get a rap soda out in 2017. I bought one in 2018. That's what got me to the big leagues. Do I understand? Like that's how I built my slider to get back to to create a, a strikeout pitch to get to the big leagues. Yeah. Then I'm going by a track man because now that's the best ne- next best thing. I bought it in 22 because I was sending rap soda numbers to people and they weren't. They don't care about them anymore. They don't truly trust them. You need track man numbers. You need this. You need that. Okay, I'll go buy a track man. So now I have one. Now it's, all right, now let's go off of these numbers. But you still got to know how to go 
how do you throw a oh strike? Well, in a game, you don't have it. You don't have it. You don't right? have that real time and info no. while you're out there. And that's where like so that feel like Labby talk Chad talks about oh, feel it's all about feel. It's but about how feel. do you? But now creating it, and that's what like the the practice. It's a practice tool. Like you're not going to be able to use it in the game now. If you're working on for like for me, it's creating pitches. Yeah, you look at it, you go, all right, I threw three or four. Which one did you like the best? I like the third one. What what happens, and I see it in pro ball all the time, is I throw a slider and then I look right to the iPad. What was that? I'll throw another one. No, let's throw five, six, seven pitches. Let's throw a sequence. Let's throw mm-hmm. a batter. Boom, I really like that second slider. What was Right, like, was you, that? yeah, you're throwing yeah. an A-B I'm throwing and then looking bat, at that data. And then looking at it. Right, I'm trying no to look at it. And even Almost overanalyzing over. everything. Like, it's like just everything. And like, they're throwing to that computer mm-hmm. as opposed to we're not throwing to hitters. We're not trying to get out. Yes. And, and that's something I talk to a lot of our younger guys, as in younger 25, 26-year-olds in AAA. Like, at the end of the day, it's can you get outs, right? They're, and the reason why they like the number so much is there's no measurement for – what is in between your ears and what's between your legs. There's nothing there that can say he can do it. He's an absolute grinder. When it's 2-2, a guy's on third and one out, we know that Labby's going to drive the ball in. We're going to get the run in. We're gonna, he's going to hit a ground ball up the middle, and we're going to get the run in. Or 2-2, we're not going to be scared to go face whoever, Stanton, or some big big donkey at, at home plate. And that's what the numbers don't – they cannot quantify what the what's going on in between your head and what – like. If you're scared, are you nervous? It's about doing it and showing up every single day and doing it for a long time and learning from those experiences. Um, and that's part of playing a long time and, and listening to guys and being like, "How did you get a, a How did you get over that?" Because I was nervous as heck facing the Yankees my first time, but then you go out there and you face them number two, number three, number four. You get used to it. That feeling doesn't. You're still nervous. You're still got the butterflies. You're still getting jitters. But how do you control it? Right, and I, I think yeah, you see that at the high school level, and I think that's kind of what the, the the scout team kind of brings is, how do you you get those kids in that controlled environment against their own peers? How do you get them to lower their heart rate? How do you get them to succeed at a high clip against good competition? And yeah, I see that. I was watching Fresno State the other day at the uh, the Cal Poly game and at the inter squad, and you could see guys coming in and they're putting so much pressure on themselves. And all I could think about is I remember that. Like that, I remember it's not easy to go throw a strike. It's, it's not like easy to go hit in these situations. They're thinking about making the next three pitches instead of yeah. the next pitch. And they're 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 telling like there no, there's no confidence in what they're doing. They're just trying to like don't screw it up or like they're going to out stuff somebody. They're going to out track man the, well, the hitter. The hard reality is is that. Some of these inner squads are these guys' opportunities for the spring. It is. So, I mean, I get so that is, pressure. So is spring training, though. Sure, sure. Right? So is every time Every time you step on the field is your opportunity. Right? No it, and, and, I, and I talk to the, the can Red Can the Sox coach scout. trust you? That's, that's 100%, all it is. Yeah. And on the pitching side, it's can you throw strikes? And on the hitting side is can you put the ball in play? And do you understand when you're playing defense, there's no slumping. There's no slumping in defense. you got to be able to play D, and you got to be able to put the ball in play when it's your at-bat. And on the – on the on the pitching side, it's you got to be able to throw strikes. There's no there's no defense for walks, and it's something I never knew until I really got into pro ball. And I mean, I walk three, four, five hitters in a game, and I'm like, God, how do I give up six runs? I only gave up two or three hits. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, Billy Hamilton's scoring on pitch number <laughs> six. I walk him on yeah, four. Yeah. He's still second, goes to third, and it's one nothing. It's one nothing. <laughs> and six eye. pitches in, yeah. yeah. Yep. And and that was that was a year that I really figured out, like, God, this guy, if I just make him hit it. He's only on base one every five. He's hitting 200, 220. But when I walk him, he's scoring five out of five. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, that's just my little spill on, like, you just got to be able to, to well, get into it. And we kind of started this with, like, working out and, and the younger guys. So the guys, like, that's why I was going to ask Chad, like, he always talked about when you were, I think when you first got into pro ball, you're talking about working with these guys in groups. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, like, these guys that don't have track, man, they don't have, you know, all this stuff. Like My, my biggest thing was, when I came back, we all worked out at City. Like all the pro go- pro guys, we were at we City. We had a good or, culture. But can I ask you? So was it? But I because picked, you needed to be. Did you need somebody else to keep on your ass? No. Or I wanted to be around. No. I wanted to be around the. Best. Well, that's what I'm saying. Do you need? 
you know, like there's guys that may need that. I don't know. Like you, we're talking about high that. school kids. Look at if you need well, and you're a pro ball and you need somebody. To <laughs> yeah, you're you're going to be really going to be doing he, it. Very I'm, well. I'm trying to. He wanted I'm trying to be to, with Woody and Gilbert and pick their brain. Right, right. When I when I was at City and Jerome Williams would always come back. He's a pitcher that pitched in the big leagues. I I would always talk to him how he would pitch me in situations. For sure. Johnny Osahini mm-hmm. would be back. How would you pitch me? I like talking to the pitchers a lot more sometimes than the hitters because you know me and labby might not be the same hitter so something he has to offer me might be a different kind of thing but a pitcher they're going to pitch me try to pitch me the same way to get me out so i would always like to talk to the pitchers and and i actually learned that in pro ball when a pitcher they go talk to hitters Mm -hmm. you know they like to talk to hitters and know what they're looking for and, and that kind of thing um so i think even in high school talking to guys on how like when we say watch a guy that looks like you how he gets pitched like a 3-4 hitter, how did the 3-hitter get pitched? Mm-hmm. You might get pitched that way. You can talk about that with your teammates in the dugout, and I think that's what we're talking about. There needs to be more baseball talk, Yes, you know, about... Well, that's why I like the group <clears throat> aspect, because there's yes. more eyes on things. Maybe guys keep you, not maybe not to motivate you, but, like, keep you accountable. No, Help I, push you, compete. And it, and it does compete. it without doing it. You well, can set because up I'm a competition gonna, in there, man. Can, yeah. That's what I do with the infield guys, man, because yeah. I got a couple younger younger kids that they're pretty slick with the glove man and you know i try to challenge a couple of them juniors or seniors that might be out there be like hey man how come the eighth grader how come he's so smooth how come he can do this how come i've had to tell you six times to to relax your hands and and stop flipping your glove down but the this this younger cat gets it hey man this younger cat's going to take your job when he's a sophomore and you're a senior if you don't yeah. figure it out you know it's like you can build up a little competition with them um and, and it's like you say when you're talking about demonstrating stuff like there's something that you might be talking to a kid and he just listens to you. You know, he's going to pick up a couple nuggets, what you're dropping on the other kid. Um, just maybe it's his footwork. Maybe I haven't talked to him specifically about his footwork, but it's something that he noticed by watching another kid. And, and then you get to where they're at practice and they start, it starts, dude, that's the thing about when you're around, like you start becoming a coach when you care about it, because you're not trying to tell another dude how to do something. But I remember being in the dugout in college all the time primarily college most of the time in pro ball you didn't do you kind of tread a little bit lighter oh, yeah. in pro ball but <laughs> in a more team atmosphere like college like you could go up to your i could go up to my second base and be like hey dude you need to start staying on, down on that ball dude you know you're, you're coming off the ball you're trying to hit a bomb dude you need to be hitting that ball the right center and all right you know or he'd do the same to me hey why you dude why are you throwing the ball away man just take your time or, or you know where you could start coaching a dude up hey dude you're not staying through that ball you're you're pulling off it a little bit I am. Yeah, man. And you start trusting that guy because that guy's been in the same group with you for freaking 35 games. He's seen you swing the bat plenty to know when you're doing stuff right, when you may be off a little bit. So it's nice to have that group setting for a little competition. It, it gives them a little camaraderie. Um, and then primarily the competition, man, right. because you get them around, they start sizing each other up against no each profession, other. No yeah, professional man. likes losing. No. Right? And, th- and that's what you, you, especially you get in the weight room, you, you get into running. Like I need a group to go run. I don't, I hate running. I'm not going to run 10 sprints by myself. <laughs> I got no problem waking up at 4:45 to go get in the gym. I'll get in the gym every single day, but you want me to go run? I, I either got to go pay somebody, which was usually drew, or I get a group <laughs> of dudes and go, Hey, we're going to go run. Um, and that was the only way. And now, if I'm running with some high school college kids, right? We had our college kids back for Thanksgiving break. I'm not trying to lose. I'm no. not out there. Oh, I'll just dog it at 70% and then let them win. And they, they'll feel good. No, I'm going to push them just as hard. And I think that's where the group aspect of mm-hmm. when we were in college, I mean, or in pro ball early in our careers was it was that group setting of we were blessed to work out with Garza. And it, I think it pushed him just as much as it, it definitely pushed me to be like, that dude's in the like he's in the been in the big leagues for two years now and he's going hard and he's looking at us going like hey this kid's 20 years old and he's trying to take my job just like we're talking about with the youngsters and right i'm 35 i had guys that were 22 on my team we got a 13 year gap right so i'm talking about my son's three right now (laughs) against a junior in high school Mm -hmm. again wyatt prieto right that's who at the end of the day is Wyatt going to stay in the game until he's 35 and Cash is going to be 22 trying to take his job? I'm if we if everything adds up together, ideally they're both playing pro ball. Right? Something like that. Like that's a big gap. I had guys that never saw the cleats that I wore in my opening day. <laughs> my shortstop was like I've never seen those. Like shoe mm-hmm. guy. And I was like, "Bro, these are from 07, 08." And I had to wear them. But like that's that's the age gap and that's what can push you 
And if those guys are learning from a guy that's been in there for 15, 16 years or whoever, if it's two years of pro experience, that's where you're going to learn and you're going to understand, like, there's it's a different game. We're all playing 60 feet, 6 inches, 90-foot bases, but at the same time, it is a different – we're playing chess the whole time. It's a different mind game once you get into pro ball and you're playing 162, 140, 144, whatever it is. And it's the same with going to, to a D1. You're playing 85, 90 games in a year with summer ball, fall ball, you know, your season, right? They're playing a lot of games as opposed to a high school season's 28 games or 30 games, whatever that is, and you get a couple of inner squads or some fall ball games. They're playing 35 games in a year competitively. A college guy, Fresno State, they had to be playing a bunch. Fresno City's, I watched seven or eight games, and I was out there a whole lot. So, like, all those game repetitions is how you get back to the mental side of the game, and I think that's kind of – What's gone from the game was this game used to be when I was growing up, this game's 90% mental. I never understood it. Never understood it until you start thinking of like, all right, what's next? What's the next play? What's the next pitch? Like everything is a, a mental check, check off, check the box, check the box all the way down the list, no matter what position, if it's defense, if you're on offense or you're pitching, what is he trying to do? How am I going to combat that? Right. The pit, the hitters thinking the same thing. Like he's trying to get me to hit a ground ball at third base. I'm trying to get a ball to the right side of the field score on the run, right? And so we're playing chess and, and moving pieces and, and setting things up. As in, in high school, we usually listen to, on the pitching side is, we just listen, hey, fastball away. Why? Right? And that's where the understanding of why we are doing things a certain way. Mm-hmm. Why do we try to stay inside the ball? Because when you need it, nobody just goes, hey, just hit a hard ground ball, a shortstop, it works all the time. Because well, that swing no. usually that that swing usually works. You stay inside the right? baseball, it's, you're going to you, be pretty good. Yeah, uh, you stay, you stay in, inside the ball. Yeah, yeah, you're going to. Yeah. It gives you more. Uh, you just have more chance of success. To, yeah, to stay on in playing. I and, watched and, two of the best players in the game, and that's all they worked on. And you got the whole Who? field. JD to work and Mookie. With. That's yep. all they did in BP. Stay inside the ball. Stay inside the ball. Hit, hit the bullpen mm-hmm. in right center in, in Fenway. And I mean, they were pretty good. They're still playing. <laughs> Making a lot of money. <laughs> You mean you don't have to play up as a ten year old to be ready? <laughs> yeah, if you get on the big field at ten, you'll be better. Ten, you can play. Well, some the of these field. like these things we're talking about, like do you th- do you think accidentally like this travel ball stuff? And then again, like it's not bad. Like there's a lot of good travel, but I'm just saying there my, are some some. But what I'm good saying ones. is is on accident. Do you think because there's so many games being played, that's 100%. why they practice less because we can't be hurt for the game? So. Who, did you who guys was a basketball see, uh, coach? Did you see like Gino, we don't practice. Gino Uriema, yeah. The, oh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Coach was just talking about. He's talking about how come the European Europe. players are ahead of the American players. It was practicing. It's, they yeah. practice five days a week and play one. The American guys play five days and practice one. So, so what are the what does the Latin guys do? The Latin guys bro, practice. The Latins a, practice. They, they like practice like they you have no it. idea. Yeah. Like that's what they do all day. They don't have gym or PE or calculus to go to. They're but going they're also to the not field. playing games. Like they're no. literally just practicing, <laughs> mm-hmm. and then they're doing like live abs, just like, whacking balls and pitching, like facing dudes. Like that's they they get after it, and it's all setting. day long, man. From Seems the sun work. up till the sundown. Well, Seems to work for them. Yeah, but they're getting these things over there. These cell phones are starting to. Like it's starting to come into the game. Trotsky talks about that a lot because Nate goes, Nate will spend a lot of time in the Dominican. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the first things he said. He, he says, you know, the development over there used to be like super, like they were way further ahead. He said, but since the cell phone started showing up, they've noticed like a, a kind of a decline. But I mean, just like at normal, dude, just go to, I was at the North football game last week. I don't even know if any of the kids watch the game anymore. It's like they're just on their their phones. And it's just, that's they're, the title they're, game they're, that was next year down. It's game. like you know, I don't I don't get it. But anyways, that's well, a whole so other topic. Kind of saying that too. I saw this on Twitter. Just get your thoughts. And it was JC. I don't know who this person is, but their tweet was uh, unpopular opinion, probably. But baseball showcases for kids who've never played a varsity high school game. Is a complete waste of time and money. No, not necessarily. A showcase for a I kid actually, that hasn't played varsity. I had a kid not play a game in varsity, have a pretty good sized scholarship to a pretty good sized school, right? And he had. And I've varsity seen that too. Yeah. And, and and I'm not knocking it, but it's like, but but he, not all showcases 
are created equal. No, no not at all. Right? No. So it's understanding then. It's knowing which ones. There's there's certain. There's, but how do people find this out? They like, can't. It, I don't know because I wasn't a part of it. And I never. They don't. I was before all of it. Most of these guys get referred by other, you know, it's like a dad sit around, they'll, they'll run into a, a dad they might have played Little League ball against, and they're like, hey, what are you doing with Young Junior next year? Oh, he's going to play for such and such. Oh, and all of a sudden they inquire about it, and they join. A lot of these people go into a blind. Um, you know, they see the shirts and they see the tweets, but they don't really know the, they don't know what goes on behind the scenes per se. Like, you know, a lot of the programs get painted. It's really, Oh, you're going to get a scholarship and you, you know, you're playing on these elite teams and this elite development, but you're really paying for just the shirt and and the hat and the glamor to wear around town. Um, I mean, I don't know. I'm sure you guys have noticed it, but man, I, 10 years ago, like when I first started scouting, I I used to see a lot of high school hats programs they played for now. I don't see a high school hat. And I, I mean, very few and far between DC kids wearing their high school hats. I see tons of travel ball hats everywhere. And it's like, I constantly have, it gets old. I have to ask a kid at a camp, Hey, what high school do you go to? And they're like, well, I'll, I'll mess with them. I'll say, Hey, what, uh, what, what high, high school is that? Yeah. <laughs> and they're like, well, it's not a high school. It's a travel team. I'm like, Oh no kidding. Well, where's your home field? And they're just like, well, we don't have a home field. And I'm like, okay, so where would, if I was going to go watch you next spring, where am I going to watch you? Oh, my high school. Okay. Well, why aren't you proud of wearing where your high school is? Like, that's where I'm going to come see you. That's where you're going to a high school to go to. No, nah, man. Transfer. How many times you've watched that big league game? How many times they announced this guy played for the Canes travel team? Or this never, for, never, never. They never. don't announce that, never. man. They'll, they'll talk about, Hey, this guy went to Middleton high school. Uh, you know who went there? Uh, so-and-so went there. Uh, you know, another famous guy, you know, pro right, boxer right. went there. You know, they talk about the high school they went to and the, the history of the high school not not if they bring it up at all yeah um and the other thing is like what have we done with rings like we've deglorified a ring i when i went to cooperstown we got a ring right and i thought that was one of the coolest things ever but that was because i mean it was five thousand dollars in 2001 to go to cooperstown but you you also have to like you got to I don't earn your know. way to that's get there. Big, right? That's you a gotta, big. That's you got to win other Cooper tournaments, right? Big tournament. You got to like qualify, saying, right? It was something I, like that. I don't even know how we did. I was twelve, but I knew that we went and I, we got a ring, and I was like, that was cool. And then I don't pay attention to travel ball for a long time for eight years. My first eight years of pro ball, and then it's but every tournament's now getting a ring, and it's I don't un, I not I just never, first place either. No, no, and that's what I I never understood it, but like that's what. I remember that was the very first ring that I ever got was in Cooperstown. And I was like, it's one of the biggest tournaments on planet earth. There was 96 oh, teams you're a and, kid, yeah. and we're, you're right. And you're there for a week and it's a whole ordeal. Um, but now it's every single tournament from up and down the whole Valley. That's their trophy, which I don't understand why or where, or, I mean, I, People guess, got cheap. Nobody wants to give a shirt anymore. A shirt, or a I mean, shirt, I got a whole dude. closet. What happened to the shirts, the man? Day. The shirts are cool. You know, you, you could put your sponsors on the back. Yeah, you know, is uh, whatever. I, I just feel like we've deglorified it to where. What do these kids play for in high school? They're like, ah, it's just a Valley Championship ring. I got a box full of rings at home. Yeah. Well, or I played for a PG ring. What's a PG ring in the summer, dude? That that's a fifty-five cents in in whatever the uh, company is that sells them. I mean, uh, I like. I guess the difference is like. The high school part of that, like being, we all chased the Valley Championship yeah, ring. Yeah, I know I did. I didn't, I still, I don't even know if I've ever seen one because Central, we didn't, we didn't get that. <laughs> no. You know what I mean? And that's just, I I don't even know what they look like. It it, but it mattered growing up. I do. It mattered yeah, I growing up. It was huge <laughs> growing up. Like that's, I mean, I remember football. That was like, our baseball program in high school wasn't as, um, let's just say my, our football program, we had an awesome football coach when I went to high school at Menachee. Mike Anderson, like it was always in, and, and I always tell people this, that dudes, I didn't get to the big leagues because I played baseball. I got to the big leagues cause I played high school football for this guy. Um, it was about the big picture. Like who cares about the UIL? It's, yeah. it, nobody cares. It, it, you went five and only a while. Big deal, dude. They're not going to remember you. They'll remember you. If you win the Valley, when you're from Menachee and you win the Valley, like that was the goal. Everything we did was in 14s because you had to play 14 games to get to the Valley title. So our sprints were 14s. Everything was geared around this mentality of 14 and it was the bigger picture. And at that time you didn't really, you know, I didn't really sink into me then. And as I got to junior college, I started seeing like, dude, this guy is so right. It is the bigger picture. It's not about just being good here. It's about being good all over to where, you know, not just statewide. Like I want people to know about me nationally, like to where you're getting the attention maybe of being recruited nationally to where a school, the Citadel offered me the full ride 
on the spot and it's like dude i don't even know where the citadel is dude. <laughs> and then you know my coach is like yeah it's like a school down here and then i end up finding out dallas mcpherson went there and i'm like holy shit, you know shit that might not have been a bad place to go yeah. at the end of the day but dude you you want that kind of exposure but you earn that exposure by playing at a high level you don't get it by playing uh you know being good at the local tournament like you got to play dude and, and play in front of people and not just play but put put up numbers like numbers speak like just because you roll in in your travel ball gear dude that doesn't mean we're gonna like you or that doesn't mean you're good like you gotta go out and play the game dude like go show us why you deserve to be you know looked at across the country or, or yeah, you're considered a get, prospect yeah they get caught up in the how, how do you get your reps but also how do you do work on your fundamentals and i think there's not a whole lot of people that do both yeah they they you either get some guys that are fundamentally sound and they're 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 usually raw is what a lot of guys would say because they, they probably play to it basketball football and baseball and they're probably raw in all three of them but they're really good athletes mm -hmm. and then they'll work on some fundamentals in the off season, but then they're not getting all that game ex experience and then you got a lot of guys that are playing I've heard of people playing 100, 120 games in a season at 12, 13, 14 years old, and I'm going, golly, that's a lot of games. I didn't even play that. They don't do the numbers and, on but that. They, like, yeah, what they, is the success rate of a kid that plays 120 games as a 10-year-old yeah. that gets to the big leagues? Like, where are the numbers on that? They don't want to show you those numbers because no. then somebody's going to lose money because that's a lot of tournaments that now they're going to lose because people aren't going to do that. It, I, it's sad to say, but at the end of the day, the whole travel ball deal, it boils down to money, man. It, it's all, it, it's I mean, disgustingly is money. money. Um, you know, and I always go back to it, and you guys are probably laugh, but, but the travel ball scene, like, okay, we talk about all the time when we're watching a game, how come baseball is so bad? Why is baseball bad? Why? Well, I don't like saying this, but look at some of the dudes that are coaching some of these younger teams. I go watch these teams, at, these tournaments that my son participates in, and, and you know, I, I watch a lot of the, my buddy's kids play as well. And, like, the slop – the lack of hustle, just the lack of coaching, the lack of doing the right things. Like, it, it, yes, the discipline, the respect for the game. Like nobody yes, teaches so the respect for the game that's anymore. The big like one. I it, think I was it's blessed. Unbelievable. Middle school. I had two coaches that, I mean, I think the reason I, oh, I became the person I am baseball wise is because of who coached me. I had Absolutely. a very good 11 and 12 year old coach. He was a police officer. I mean, dedication, respect, like dude was about it. And, Middle school, I had Coach Gamini, who played at Fresno mm -hmm. State, coached at Fresno City, and Mike Ross, who had eight years of professional experience. Yep. Those were my middle school coaches. Yep. And then I walked into Pat Weyer, who was a great coach at, at Central, mm -hmm. and then walked into Fresno City and then you know played pro ball from then on. But like every single one of those guys, if they wanted to, they could still be coaching at a high level today. And th I think that's what really – I mean, I, I was blessed with that. right? And I, I think a lot of guys aren't – they don't – they don't understand that just having guys that understand the game as your coach is a big part of it. But then under like having dedication, having some respect to the game, understanding the, the ins and outs of the, the small stuff mm -hmm. is a big part of growing up. But it's not only growing up as a baseball player, but literally as a man, just growing up and understanding like you can't just show up 15 minutes late and think you're just going to walk onto the field and yeah. it's going to be OK. And it's I, I let I don't me ask like you it. guys this. How many times do you guys wear tube socks? Never. Okay, that I, I I'm not lying to you. That is like the my biggest pet yes. peeve with the baseball players. I didn't, dude. I didn't. Start. And they got their pants like up like six inches, so you can oh, see the white whole white socks. tube sock. Yeah. And it's Terrible. like I scratch my head. I'm like, how hard is it to have? Mostly, you can have a solid color, yeah. but you don't have to wear stirrups anymore. We had to wear stirrups yeah. at Fresno State, so you had to always wear that way. But now it's like I go out and I'm like, dude, are, are you wearing tube socks? Or the pitcher have baggy are those ankle socks? Like, yeah. what are you wearing? Like, it just would you wear tube socks with a suit if you had to go and you're a banker? No, no, man, you get laughed out of your freaking office, dude. <laughs> Somebody probably throw a pair of socks on your desk and be like, "Hey, dude, let's Put clean it up on. a little bit tomorrow." You know, <laughs> you know, dress up. Like they don't give a shit, no. and and it's hard to do because then you're, oh my goodness, I, you know, there's. I don't even want to get into it, but you might hurt somebody's feelings because they you making them wear a color sock. Like, just uh, take some pride. Like, you know, put on a belt. I, would you ever wear a uniform without uh, a belt? Never. God, dude, how you forget your belt? I you coached know? with a cup my first four years because <laughs> I was so used to wearing a cup. Yeah, I forgot exactly. A belt. I forgot a belt. I think it was for freshman or J. I, I, I did JV. I did too. <laughs> forget my weird belt. Not wearing too, one, dude. I did. Like, now I did these kids don't years. wear cups. They don't wear. No, it. yeah, it's crazy. Like to me. the ball that never going to take a bad hop. <clears throat> Fields are good. Up I here. try to hit them hard at them when we do the infield. Oh, you're not wearing a cup. Huh? <laughs> All right, here we 
<laughs> Here it comes. Yeah. Hey, yeah, I hope you got good hands, bud. Good you feet. weren't born in the Dominican and grew up <laughs> with that one. You, yeah. You're going to no, need man. one. Yeah, For no, sure. I, I forgot a belt. I would tell my coach, like, hey, I, it's game day, too. The socks thing kills me, dude. And like, he's like, go get I'm going to go get it. So I went back and got it. He's like, now you're late. And I, I didn't start. Yeah. So, okay, I, I got a funny story about my kid, right? So I'm, like, coaching this team last year. And, and dude, it, it's so frustrating. It, it, it made it. Deep down, I'm like kind of laughing because he's kind of like trying to be like himself and shit. But it, it on the other hand, it, it really pisses me off because it's like this kid goes with me to scout ball. He listens to me talk to these people about, you know, being have just present yourself like a ball player, right? So he's got a game at River Park one night. And we go out there and I, I remember telling him, hey, get ready. He wanted he goes, dad, what socks are we wearing? I said, red. Oh, I can hear him grumbling, right? So, man, I wasn't even paying attention, dude. We get out to River Park, and I'm starting to throw these little dudes wiffle balls, and he's up there to hit, and he lifts his leg up, and I'm like, I dude, I'd like just stop. I'm like, are those freaking in and out burger socks? You know, my kids got on these in and I see palm trees and shit. And I'm just like, I flip out, and I'm like, dude, are you shitting me? How are you gonna do this? This is like the most embarrassing thing right here. Like, I'm a scout, dude. And you're wearing your freaking in and out burger socks. Like, my God. So. I just don't, it's this, this era that we're in. It's like the slides everywhere, slides everywhere. Dude. Yeah. What happens if it's wet and it's raining? Do you want to walk around with wet socks all day? I, hey man. Well, I don't, I mean, from little league until I got a metal cleat, I just wore my cleats in oh. little league to the field. Mm -hmm. Like all these little leaguers, they wear Crocs and stuff and then they, they change got, in their cleats. They got slides. You're wearing molded. You showing wear, up to the park with your cleats just on. Just show up with your cleats yeah, yeah. on. Like mm -hmm. it, that just bothers me a little bit too. And it's all just. Right. It's weird. Sorry, I'm on over my my pet peeve. <laughs> nah, it's <laughs> uniform, but nah, it I just like, goes along with like if you go back and if you teach these kids at a young age, man, like hey, this is like we used to have a man. We we're in college, and Coach Bennett ran us through a uniform talk. That was part of. There's a lot of like, colleges that do it. Yeah, man, and how you wear your uniform and why why you wear your uniform a certain way. Like they're you know just for the strike zone per se. Pants up, pants down. Hey, man, you might have some low pitches called on you if he doesn't see where your pants are. Hey, whether that's true or not so be it but dude just just be presentable like wear the uniform like be proud of where you're from be, well, be, be I mean, proud yeah, of where you, you're you don't want to yeah. if you're wearing your high school's uni you don't want to look like a piece of trap you're representing that team man the, the program like yeah it's like everybody around here so they're so pumped up about going to certain high school and then all of a sudden i see them around town they're not even wearing their high school gear like dude you're so proud of this school but you don't even wear the gear like are you not are, i mean do you not care is it not important to you i, I don't know <clears throat> it's the kind of stuff that just you, and a guy like me like dude a guy that show if i'm there to watch out i promise you dude if I, if a kid shows up that i'm watching scout and i see he's wearing tube socks i'm out dude i'm out I'm how, how out. many of them o-u-t bye bye we haven't had a bunch of scouts on here okay i don't even think you might be the only one how much of you guys see the similar see the similar things honestly when you talking guys and you have to, obviously you're not gonna when you're names, talking about like, like a player yeah, yeah sure and like I'm, I'm Let's just say that the older baseball guys, they they recognize like it it the little things that, that I'm that I'm saying it matters to the older baseball guys. The newer dudes that have come on the scene that are kind of fresh, like they're happy to be scouts. They don't think about that because they've never been around. Like they also the, need somebody to come look at the guys. They're the saying true they respect, write up. Yeah, the true respect part of the game and, and the history of it. These kids don't know the history of the game either. It's pathetic, man. I'll throw names out of guys that played five, six years ago. And they're like, looking at me, like, who's that? And I'm like, Oh my God, that wasn't even that long ago. And it, but it, everybody's a little bit different, but there's certain things that man, like wearing a uniform, dude, it's not hard. You don't have to have talent to wear a uniform the right way. Or, you know, you want to wear your pants down. So be it, dude. But wear some socks in case you slide <laughs> and your pant leg comes up. You're not wearing ankle socks. You know, it's going to maybe be a turnoff. Unfortunately, I, it, it, it is at times. You're really going to have to be a hell of a player for me to get over tube socks, dude. Like, you just are. <laughs> I, I don't think I, I can't remember seeing that, but. Oh, just pay attention, tube man. Socks. Start what are you talking about, when you dude? Who, everybody have been I, we'd have guys wear ankle socks, but like just straight tube socks. I don't remember. Yes. Just, well, just we well, would the, see the belt thing the white all cruise, the time. It's the white crew socks. It's not. Yes. it's not like long tube socks. It's no, just no. it's just the white socks. The ridges in it. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. sanitary yeah. supposed yeah. to be smooth. Yeah. Well, these guys got these. You know, the the ankle part is <clears> smooth, but then up the leg is like these ridges. And I'm looking at them. What are you What are you wearing, man? I mean, can you not laugh a kid out of practice anymore because of that? I mean, no, I might. 
that's HR. I'm sure Zavorik, when I was in high school, would have just laughed us out of practice and told us to go home. Yeah, I could see that. Or we'd be running or something. I mean, something. just have a practice pair of socks that you don't wash until the end of the week. That'd be, and then you have game socks. Yeah. Like, or, that's what I had. Go buy a couple pairs and yeah. work that washing machine a little yeah. bit, you know? <laughs> Learn how to do some laundry. Uh, some responsibility. You know, we uh, we talk about the, the, the Hall of Fame from time to time. I don't know if you guys have seen the ballot out yet. Uh, for 24 um, there's some dudes uh, new guys Adrian Beltre Joe Maurer Chase Utley are some of the guys that uh, some notable newcomers um, first candidates to join the yeah so let's see here we go Todd Helton Billy Wagner Andrew Jones are trending towards Cooperstown Cooperstown they're saying this year uh, you guys see some of the names on the list um Let's see here. Helton Wagner Jones among the top. Let's see. I'm trying to get the the percentages here. Helton fell just shy last year. 72% needing 75. I would say he's probably a lock this year. But you got like Adrian Beltre's numbers are interesting. Uh Gary Sheffield's another one who's in I think he's the only one in his final final year on the ballot. Uh but he's a 500 home run guy. Um what do you what do you guys think on this stuff? Like I I don't, I've never had bolt all you in here to talk about it. And there's a, some guys on this list that aren't going to get in that I should probably get in. There's always a guy like I've never really looked at the list when they come out. Um, I mean, there's guys that I look at on there that are kind of like slam dunks. I, I I would think you know like Joe Maurer. Or, should anybody turn in a ballot with zero votes on it? No, because no. that's no. happened, right? That's, that guy should get punched in the face. <laughs> Like and that's, that's the other in thing. In all reality, not like, all of them are revealed. Like you don't know who all these ballots belong to. I no. don't believe you. I do. feel like if you turn they in need nobody, you should just not. On. You should not vote you ever don't get again. To vote. No, you should put. They they need to put their names on it. I want to know the guy that didn't vote for Jeter for the first ballot. I want to know, dude. He should. Well, he Griffey should be wasn't a hundred percent either. Like same thing. Like put yeah. those guys on there if they're if they're bull if they're if they have enough, you know, confidence in not checking the box and have enough confidence in putting your name by your no check. Um, or explain yeah. it. Yeah, explain why you why tell me why yeah. Derek Jeter's not a first round or first ballot Hall of Famer. Come on. Unanimous. Knock unanimous, yourself out yeah. here. Yeah, unanimous. Like, come on. Um, so it, it it's interesting. You know, you look at the guys who had bad relationships with the media that's on the list. You know, that's gonna play a big that's part, a big part in of it. it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Who who might have tested who might have had some steroid <laughs> allegations next to their name? Like those are all gonna play, you know, a big and how do big, you feel about that stuff personally? For me? Yeah. Man, there are so many guys doing it. Like, why are you going to hold one guy out that, I, I, I don't know, it's, it, I'm kind of, it, it's a little mixed with me just because uh, it, when there was no testing that was, that could solidify that this guy really took it, then how are you going to clump him in this, this category right. and, oh, he's in the steroid area. Well, yeah, if he might have been. Suspended, but, if you weren't suspended, then yeah, what like, was like, I, I understand it was it. Like, to me, morally right, no, it wasn't morally right. But at the same time, like, there's rules against it now. I mean, I've been tested 17 years, probably five tests a year, roughly. That's a lot. Yeah. 85, 85 tests, 75 tests, something like that, right? Like, we get tested all the time. We're open to them, even in the off offseason, um, right? But now, that's what the rules are, right? And it's the same thing. Like, Adderall pills have changed the testing situation, mm-hmm. Ritalin pills, like, you know, any of those, that's all changed. Shit, I mean, energy since. drinks. Energy drinks. energy drinks that have right. shit in it you yeah. can't take anymore. I mean. Right, and that's, I mean, I'm I'm very cautious of what I put in my body because of that. And, like, a lot of the stuff is NSF certified, which I don't necessarily is like, oh, man, that's the best stuff. But it's just, it's going to claim that it won't make you test positive. And at the end of the day, if you're a professional athlete or for this instance, a professional baseball player, you got to understand what you're doing, right? Um, but... That's where, in my opinion, early 2000s, late 90s, like guys were doing different things in the 60s. I got coaches from way back when saying like what kind of anti-inflammatory pills they were taking, Mm -hmm. like horse pills and stuff. Like that's what helped them not get Tommy John surgery. And so it's like at every every, every level, everybody's, you know, seeing where that line is. Well, how how many years were guys putting shit on a baseball? A long time. I did doing it since the. I did. That I'm, I won't. But I'm just saying. Like, you, you, you you don't, don't, yeah. But now that the rule is that you can't put it on there, I don't put it on there, right? But if the rule was, hey, 
as long as you don't make it obvious that you're putting pine tar on your fingers or whatever, then perfect. I'm going to, I'm going to find get a way. To the line. Well, I'm saying, I'm man, what, are, what are the odds that the pitcher, go. a pitcher from 25 years ago is in the hall of fame? We were talking about nobody guys, knew well, for a era. decade he had, you know, eight. every era is different. Right. Every, there's every some names from years. this list. Well, that's why I'm saying like you got, you know, era, Neil you know, Manny like, and, and, and a rod are the two that just jump out. Yeah. But okay. I mean, you go look at their numbers and if that's what we're basing it on, they're no doubters. Yeah, so what about Andy Pettit? Sure. Pettit. Yeah. He's another guy that has been on that list. I, yeah. I don't know. Right. But uh, like you get guys from the fifties scuffing baseballs on purpose with sandpaper on their thumb and their glove hand. Mm. Yeah. Their stuff was nasty. No wonder why they won. What uh, so many games are they? It's been a long time since we've uh, seen right? like 200 Scott, wins. Mike Scott with the yeah. Astros, dude, he had the sandpaper in his glove. He right? scuffed everything against the Mets. And and that's where, where I'm like, mind. that was again, you can call it cheating. You can call it pushing the line. You can call it trying to win. Right. But at the same time, he's, Guys that were are in the Hall of Fame have tested positive, have uh, said they've taken it, they've cheated in doing all sorts of different things. I don't know. I don't. I don't like the whole situation now. But then there's, if you get, I also think that if you test positive for a injectable steroid, you should just get banned from baseball. Guess what? Guys won't do it because you're you're seeing guys that are on their way out. Or do I think if I took steroids right now, I could throw 98 again? Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I honestly do. I was 91 to 94 my last game of the year, in whatever, into September. At 35 years old, if I wanted to take something, I think I could. Would I? Absolutely not. But that's just the rules are the rules. I'm not getting, I'm not even going to flirt with that line. But could I go and, if I have one really good year, I can go to arbitration and make a million and a half, two million dollars. Some guys are one year, one good year away from signing a four year deal for whatever, 80 million. Mm -hmm. That's the gamble. Right, and the, the the risk is eighty game suspension. The rewards, there's guys that were MVPs or the All Star game and signing for eighty million dollars the next year, that tested positive that same year. Right, so how do you? That's the risk reward. The rewards quite big in this game right now. Mm -hmm. Right, if the risk is you don't get to play, right? If Tatis's contract got banged for three hundred and fifty yeah, million, yeah, I mean, could you imagine? Right? Just done. <laughs> You're out. Yeah. Hey, you're out. You're you one. You're either your contract's null and void. You're going to go play minimum for three years, and you're going to have to do it all over again at twenty two. Do they get whatever. paid for getting popped? I don't no, think they do. No. After that eighty games, it is. Yeah. <laughs> right. But if you're saying, I mean, whatever, any of those guys, if you're saying your contract's null and void, you don't get paid for eighty games or one hundred and sixty two, and now you're going to go play at minimum at still good money, seven ninety five or whatever yeah. minimum is. Now it's crazy, but now that's a different. Your risk is a whole lot higher. Yeah. Right, I understand he was trying to get back to the game. He could say it was for his hair. I don't care what it is, but he was trying to get back onto the team and win a World Series. The risk was there. The reward was trying to go win a World Series. The risk was eighty game suspension on a three and a half million dollar deal for this year, knowing that he's going to make twenty five in a couple years down the road, yeah. and his contract signed. Right, and that's where I mean, there's a lot of guys in the game right now that have tested positive that people don't think about, that people don't even talk about. Mm -hmm. A lot of guys in the game, and they're they're signing multi year deals. There's a couple that are free agents coming up, right? But that's who, where are they going to like? They're not going for the Hall of Fame, but they're still playing the game. They're still, they're still at the end of the day taking my job. Yeah. So do you vote? Would you vote for an A Rod? Would a, um, I would vote for A Rod. He's got 600 plus home runs. I wrote for him at the very last one. Yeah, last I'm cool one. with that. I yeah, mean, let him sweat it out. <laughs> let him sweat it out. I'm like, hey man. <laughs> Like, so like Gary because, Sheffield's another no, one. No, like look at how he handled that. That guy didn't come out and no. say it. Like they, no. there was so much denial. <laughs> right, like, right. It hey, was. That's uh, what's, why? Why are we going to reward this dude and put him in right away? No, let, let him sweat his ass out. Make yeah. him think he's not going to get in, dude. You know, it's the same with with Pettit. The same thing too. It's it's funny how once the guys admit to it, all of a sudden we just oh it's okay. It's we'll okay. let him in now. Well, what like. I don't know, man. Like guys that were friendly to the to the media. Every era like, are great people. Every era is different, you know. Like every should era it be treated as, as such? During that era, I mean, because listen, we've we've I beat mean, Bud Selig's in. Yeah, yeah, <clears throat> yeah. We benefited you. more from it than him. No um, doubt. You know, Chad and I talk about it a million times. I think we even brought it up maybe the last one of the last couple episodes. Is you know, you talk about eras like this era is 
going to be different when it comes down to voting for God. Like, Absolutely. Like we're not going to see 300 game winners. We're not going to see maybe some 200 game winners. We're going to see not see 500 career, homer. Right. Like career averages are going to be down. Like we might see some 500 home run guys, but we're not going to see anybody be hitting 300, you know. I just saw that. And Josh so when Hamilton you batted 340 something in 2010, that's the highest since then. Which like, one? It was like 365 or something. Yeah, 360 three, whatever yeah. it was. But it's crazy. for My, a full year, like, yeah. And that's crazy. That's well, I saw something on Tony about years. Tony Gwynn the other day. And uh, Pete Rose. Well, that one. No, I don't even. Uh, it was just a. It was a blurb on him uh, not striking out. Yeah. Like he had more assists than he had strikeouts in his career in basketball, which was <laughs> some minute. You know, it was a really small number when you're thinking about. But okay, let's go back to impacting the game. Like, does Tony Gwynn play in today's era? What's his average exit velo? Are those singles going to count? Like, you know, you look at that, and that guy's considered probably in in my opinion, like that dude is. Top three, one of the best hitters ever, ever, ever. Like, he could hit the six hole. Didn't matter where the pitch was. Dude. He could hit the six hole. And that, that guy could just hit. But is that would that type of hitting be valued in today's game? Wade Boggs. It'd be hard. It'd be different. You know, guys like that, it, they're not hitting. It wouldn't be as praised. Where's the slugging? You know, where's the OPS? There's only one guy right now, and everybody was going crazy for it. Well, because, no, I mean, it, would, it wouldn't be yeah, as right. praised. The only one that, that, that he can, he can control he can a bat. Hits. I played winter ball with him when right. he was 16. That's that boy the, could hit. Hits. That's the thing. Uh, and I think Chad played like defense. Venezuela. Which, who? Guys just don't right. hit anymore. Oh. Guys want to slug. That's, he and let's like, let's right. call it what it is. Like, People say I'm a hitting coach. No, 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 no. You're slugging coaches. Like we're yeah. into the slug today. It's doubles and bombs, baby. That's that's what we. Hey, man. You know, and the sad thing mm-hmm. is, if you you preach it the right way, you're gonna get to those doubles and bombs. You yeah. know, like it, it's just funny. Like it's the OPS and and how much can you impact the game and singles, dude. It's like I mean, I think a walk's valued more than a single. Like how is like seeing four pitches valued more than swinging a bat and putting the barrel on it and finding a hole like I, I don't understand some of the stuff and how it gets weighed out but i would imagine that a single should weigh more than a walk but hey man I don't well and the, the reason i was bringing up the era side of it and you're talking about like this era potentially uh-huh. the numbers are the criteria to be a hall of famer being less yeah what does that in 20 years what does that say to a guy like gary sheffield so who like sheffield? has better numbers than guys in 20 years that are gonna get in and yet he doesn't get in sheffield right. during this era is is one of the best players in the game and he's on his like, last attempt like this he's is, like the highest the, like he's at the pin like he he would be probably a slam dunk considered 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 a slam dunk hall of famer if he played during this era and his career ended you oh, know oh, but during time. that era he's gonna have the, the strikeout numbers are gonna be right you know like they'll take that in consideration. but in 20 years you're gonna have guys that aren't even close to his numbers correct become hall of famers yes yes yeah, that's, just because of the era we're in and, and that's what every every genre is different every era is different mm-hmm. right i mean uh louis tion has got like 285 wins right he's a red sox guy he's around the clubhouse all the time and he's like dude like numbers wise he should be in the hall he's an awesome human being like he's all like baseball rat dude mm-hmm. loves baseball but I don't think there's going to be anybody that's going to get close to his win record and he's still not going to be in the hall. Right. And he didn't make no money in the game. He was playing in like the fifties, sixties, seventies. Like he was playing before there was money. Right. And and he goes, it just hurts me that the difference would be, I would make 10 X at a signing or whatever that is. If I'm a hall of famer, if I put HOF next to my name, as opposed to just my name, man. Right. And like true Red Sox fans all know who Louis Tion is, but that's like Red Sox hall of fame. Yeah, but not for they, sure. You know, like, the, but that's where, yeah. like, that's a, a full different section of baseball that was just way different. I mean, that guy threw some solid innings back in the day, and now they're like, you look at Blake Snell, who's unbelievable pitcher. I I love mm-hmm. Snell. I love watching him pitch. He's got how many complete games? I think it's zero. Is it? Yeah, like we're not going to see guys do that right? anymore. And the way the game's structured, you're not going like to how see they throw. You back know? in the day, and, and, and some of it's stuff. not. All, that's not all they're doing, right? right that's now. how they manage games now. I hundred mean, percent the way we right. play. Well, that's just the way the game is played right now. And I think it's a different ball game. You got guys like me who are coming in and throwing the fifth and the sixth. Right, inning. and that's when people with with Kirby had such a big problem in Seattle, saying, "Hey, right. like I needed to be out of that game." Like, what? Yeah. I, what? Well, but that's, that's how, how we grew set up. It up now. Yeah, yeah, so. that's how. We, that's how. We and I guess that's an example of what I'm talking about with yeah. you know guys and from Snell Boston. Didn't want to not, come out of that playoff right. game, right? He right. threw six right. solid innings. He or he could have. That was a game that I he know who wanted him out. Yeah, the dugout. <laughs> yeah, the dugout. <laughs> yeah, they did. 
right? But that's where that like that they were happy when happened. that came into play. The analytics yeah. there, like, oh, thank you. Hall right. of Fame always intrigues me. I always find it just super interesting. Have you been? No, I need to go. Have you? Been? I need to make a trip. I've been. Yeah. I went when we were in Syracuse, dude. It's not the Hall of Fame until Bonds and Pete Rose are in. Well, Pete Rose is wow. in. He's just not in. Pete, His Bonds, stuff's all in. Bonds there. Yeah. probably won't be in. Unfortunately, like. The committee yeah. stuff. He whole. should be in. Like I, absolutely. You know, I mean, with the way gambling is now, Pete Rose yeah. has to be in. I mean, he exactly. did it as a manager. Yeah, it wasn't even as a player. No, nah, Cooper sounds <clears> one of the most pristine places. That place is that cool. It's yeah. gorgeous, man. Like just everything that just the uh, feeling a little bit of connection there. Like, yeah, I only had a little bit of time there, but still, kind of like I felt like a part of it. Kind of like, man, this place is pretty badass. Like, yeah. you know, I'm, my name could have been in here somewhere on some lineup card. You know, maybe the last yeah. Expos lineup card ever, but. You just, you don't know, man, and, and, and the names, and you don't really get a true, like you hear about the Hall of Fame, but you don't have a true appreciation for it until you're actually standing there and you're looking at some of the, you know, Babe Ruth's glove or yeah. Babe Ruth's bat. I like, like that stuff. The memorabilia is, stuff there's in there spikes, was way cooler but, than yeah. like, The plaques are yeah. cool and like Yankee Stadium. With the actual the gear. Plaque, the gear, dude, was yeah. Unreal. Their old school uniforms. That, yeah. That's probably one of my favorite things about going to Fenway. Oh, yeah. Uh, if You know, for those, anybody that's never been, but. Like walking around that place, dude, you want a little trip down memory lane, man. Like you're going to see some uniforms that you never even knew existed. The like materials guys, that you yeah, can't imagine right. playing in those summers. Straight wool. Oh, oh straight. Yeah. I mean, hood, like big <laughs> collar. You're like, man, that guy played baseball in a collar. Like <laughs> yeah, just looks like a half tuxedo, half wild wool jacket. Like wild. Thing. So it, it's just kind of cool. You, you get to see like, you know, when you're in the Hall of Fame, you get to see like how a lot of things have evolved in terms of equipment and, and the spikes and the baseballs and just the uniforms alone i mean we're gonna have like we're gonna be like these foreign leagues before long they're gonna have you know commercials all over right. their pants and jerseys yep. you know so for, well, it's already started for money they, i mean they were trying and uh, yeah it for money makes the players a lot of money is what they're saying and that's what we started with the, go to yeah and it they started with the everybody's got a sponsor on their sleeve this year and i noticed it's on the side that faces the picture oh, yeah. all yeah. the time oh, absolutely and i was like what about those switch hitters? they put them on both <laughs> Uh, yeah, I will see when this all comes in play. I, I always like talking about it first. I don't know why it interests me so much, but uh, yeah. And before we do wrap up, I got to say this. I was at the the judge, uh, Aaron Judge and Coach Batesel's, uh hall our return a Jersey retirement ceremony yeah. it was fantastic. Uh, well done by Fresno State, Fresno State baseball. Uh, Ryan Overland, co- head coach. It was it was awesome event. If you got to go. Uh, congrats to Coach Batesel and uh, Aaron Judge. Uh, it was a pretty cool honor. I know uh, Labby was there. Um, real quick, how is it? How cool is it to see? I know you don't see your, your alumni and, and some guys all the time. There's a lot of dudes there. Uh, it was great. Uh, it's always fun to get back to the to, to Biden Bennett Field and uh, get to see guys. You know, whether they were teammates of mine or guys that I watched play as a as a high school kid or guys I watched play as a fan. Um, it, it's always good to see those guys come back, the camaraderie. Um, you, you, you just kind of tend to pick up where you left off, you know, essentially, um, which, you know, it, it's pretty normal for, you know, a baseball guy. You kind of get it, you know. Right. We, you might not have seen somebody for a long time. You just kind of pick up where you left off. So it's always fun to get back and then, you know, to honor Judge and, and, and Coach Basil for, for their accomplishments, uh, not only at Fresno State, uh, well, for Bates at Fresno State, but for – Aaron and what he's done in, in the big leagues and, and with his careers, it's always awesome, man. Uh, and to have their names permanently, you know, etched in, in, in up at, uh, on the press box and on the, on the fence or, uh, you know, it, it's just a testament to, to the history of that program, not just what those guys did, but the guys that kind of laid a foundation of putting that place on the map back in the day, the stadium being built, having the facility they did, uh, and then Coach Bates will coming in and taking over and, and winning the consecutive titles, winning the national championship. Um, it, it's it's rightfully so. Like it was very much deserved in my opinion, and um, I we're super excited to see it. It was, it was an awesome day. Uh, I know Bates was pretty thrilled to be back, and, and Aaron looked like he was enjoying himself seeing yeah, some 100%. of his teammates. And uh, it, I, I thought that they did a good job with it. And um, you know, hopefully we can get that stadium cleaned up a little yeah. bit now. It's it's forward. coming along. Yeah. It's coming along. Uh, New padding on the wall, dugouts yeah, are do. done. It's not awesome to see, if you don't know, they have uh, Coach Bennett, Coach Biden, and uh, Coach Batesel's numbers all on the outfield wall now, which yep. is long overdue. Again, Ovi did it. The whole uh, athletic department did such a great job. Uh, Aaron Judge is 100% the real deal. Uh, is genuine. There's no question in my mind why that guy is the captain. Uh, and I'm, I speak for probably a bunch of people as – 
super lucky that he was a dog and uh, that's who represents the Fresno State in the big leagues among other players uh, so it was, it was just a cool event I wanted to shout that out um, thank you guys man for joining us I know it was a little quicker today but uh, we'll keep rocking and uh, it's another episode of the Hit or Die Podcast Hit or Die oh, baby <laughs>